don't think I've ever tried to speak something down before like this, but but uh, we'll give it a try. That's all we can do. Get in here and see how it goes. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. It's always good to to see smiling faces and be here in God's house. And I've been uh, thankful for what the Lord's doing in our church. It's been amazing here lately what He's doing, and I am glad to to be a part of it. So. Pastor asked me if I'd speak again tonight, and I did uh, about seven or eight months ago, and uh, I didn't give a title to it, but Brother Jim said, read, pray, and obey. That's how he entitled it, so I said, well, you can just do the same tonight and make it part two, and, uh, and if you, unless you come up with a better idea. So anyway, let's ask the good Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful tonight for your love for us, and we just uh, pray that you'd speak to us tonight, Lord. Uh, they didn't come here to hear me tonight, and we want to hear from you, Father. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would hide me behind the cross and take out anything in my life that might hinder your word or your message, and help me to share what you want, and may you speak to the hearts of each and every one of us here, and may we be blessed, and as we leave tonight, may we have something better equip, equips us to serve you and love you and draw close to you, and just thank you for dying on the cross for us and paying for our sins, Lord, and giving us your sweet Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, and we pray tonight as we share these things that they'll be special and encourage us and draw us close to you. And thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyway, I spoke the last time on mostly on reading. And tonight I thought we'd uh, talk more about prayer and fellowship and meditating with God. Uh, the scripture in John 16, 24 says, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. I remember in my last message I was talking about prayer and I share, shared a few things, uh, some of the things that God had done in my life as far as answered prayers. And I remember talking about two vehicles for two bucks in two weeks and food coming in the front door and the back door at the same time. And then an a, a illustration about a battery cable end. Uh, God has given me a lot of stories in my life as I've gone along the way. And I like to share those because I get excited. He said, up to now, you haven't asked anything in my name because they were with Jesus. The disciples were with him, and they were there to see the 5,000 fed, see the 4,000 fed, when he raised the dead, when he healed the sick. They didn't have any need of anything. And, <clears throat> you know, I had a tax trouble years ago, and I had to go, uh, I went through that for about 10 years. Well, if Jesus would have been around and I had been with him, with one of his disciples, he would have told me, he said, take your fishing pole down there to the river. And cast it in the river and, uh, you know, take up the first fish and look inside of his mouth and you'll find a coin. And you can pay, pay our taxes. And I wish I'd have been with him back then because I went through about 10 years of struggle <laughs> trying to get through that. And I'm going to share a little bit of, uh, of that down the road. But anyway, the idea of prayer, you know, God created us to have fellowship. He wants us to have a relationship, not a religion. That's what our Christianity is. He wants to have a relationship with him. Uh, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Well, you know, we think of prayers coming here tonight and letting our requests, requests be made known unto God and sharing them and bringing them up before the Lord. And this is a special time when we do that. But he says to pray without ceasing. Well, you know, we can't do that on our knees. We're driving our cars. We're working a job. So it's really an attitude in our hearts and lives of fellowshipping with God. Uh, and, you know, somebody... Prepare is asking and receiving, and it says, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that knocketh, uh, find the door is opened unto you. And, and God has given us these uh, scriptures. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Uh, be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But anyway, God intended us to have a relationship and fellowship. If you go back into Genesis chapter 3, you know he created Adam and Eve, and they're out there in the garden, and God comes down in the cool of the day, and he, he's trying to find them, and they're hiding from them. He says, where art thou? And he said, well, we, we were naked, and we were hiding. And, uh, and, and God says, uh, well, who told you you were naked? He said, uh, did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I told you not to eat of? And he said, and they were hiding. But you see, God always wanted to have fellowship with man. That's kind of why, it seems like that's why he created mankind, to have fellowship, to walk with him, and to do those kind of things. 
But, uh, and what happens is Satan wants to come between us and God so we don't talk to him and we carry those burdens ourselves and instead of taking everything to God in prayer. That's what we end up doing most of the time. Um, and I, if you go on over to, I think it's Genesis chapter 7, it talks about another fella. It says, Enoch the seventh from Adam. And he walked with God. And he was not all of a sudden for God took him. But one man said, well, with, with Enoch, he said, you know, God would come down every day and they'd go for a walk. And one night, you know, they're walking down below the ocean and God, uh, Enoch was telling him, boy, well, this is wonderful, God. You made all this stuff and the sea and all the things out there. And they just keep walking and they're talking and fellowshipping. And, and all of a sudden, uh, it's getting late, you know, and Enoch's looking at his clock. <laughs> and God says, you know what, Enoch? Tonight, we're closer to my home than we are yours. Let's just go on home. And he was not, for God took him. And that's the way God wants our relationship to be. It's, you know, he wants us to talk with him. But you know, some of us were raised in family situations where we really never talked. Uh, Carol asked me one day, he said, do you talk like this all the time? I said, I didn't used to. I said, when I married my wife Peggy, I mean, I had to, I had to start butting in to get in. <laughs> so I would talk all the time because I couldn't get in a word edgewise. So, uh, and that really changed me because my family, they just don't talk. I mean, you have to just pull stuff out of them to get, get an answer, and that's the way it is. You get on the phone, you talk about the corn, and you talk about the weather, but there's not a lot of spiritual stuff there to talk about. So anyway, God wants us to have fellowship with him. And I remember when I met Peggy, uh, my wife, uh, you know, I, she moved across the street, and I knew her for a few months and got to know a lot about her, or at least some. But uh, she moved away, and I went over to check on her one uh, weekend, or one Saturday morning, and uh, her daughter says, we're going on a field trip. We're going on a church field trip, and we're going to walk down Lookout Mountain. And they asked me if I'd come along and, and, and go, go with them if I wanted to, and I thought, well, that sounds good. But you know, we, we, so Peggy and I walked down Lookout Mountain together, and we talked back and forth, and that was the time that really bonded us. I knew some about her because she was my neighbor and vice versa, but when we started talking and having that fellowship, and getting to know each other, by the time we got down to the bottom of the mountain, we were pretty sure God had something for us and we were supposed to be, be together and meant to be together. And so about six, seven months later, we married. But that's what God wants us to have, that kind of relationship. Talking and fellowship with, with him. Not like he sees somebody up there that's ready to hit you and judge you and all that stuff. And a lot of times we relate to God as we relate to our parents. And if we had somebody that wouldn't let, talk to you, or was very gruff and rough and wouldn't, uh, you know, didn't care about your opinion. Just little children are made to be seen, not heard. Do what I tell you. Why? Because I told you so. I mean, and there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. Because uh, you can't explain everything all the time. But that's not what God intends. He wants us to love him and have a loving relationship. And that's why he says here, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And I don't think there's too much that we can do that's going to give us more joy as in when we ask God something and he gives it to us. And you really know it came from him. Just like we were talking about that battery cable in the last time and we pulled it out of that stone. And uh, it's not what it cost, brother, but it's where it came from because we needed a battery cable that, that day because the van wouldn't run. And uh, of course we had uh, those other stories that I was talking about down the road there. But anyway, um, I was thinking, uh, you know, calling to me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. Now, I, you've probably heard this before, but I think of this because here we are, we're concerned about the world and winning everybody to Jesus Christ. And it seems like a monumental task. And you may have heard this before, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. But let's say Titus is the only person here tonight that's saved in the, the whole world. And uh, Titus, uh, you know, he gets a burden for his friend. Uh, I mean, he, he sees Alan, he goes over and talks to Alan this year, and uh, he witnesses to Alan, and Alan says, you know, that sounds good, Titus. I think I'd like to have Jesus as my Savior. So at the end of the year, he got two believers on earth. And then uh, this next year, uh, Alan looks back at Sylvia, and he'd been working with her, let's say, and he starts talking to her. We got talking about co-workers, and we're talking about relatives, and he starts talking to her about Jesus, and Titus starts talking about Mark. And after two years, you got four believers. And well, the next year, all four of you talk to somebody. Somebody talks to Lori and, and, uh, and Blake and, and uh, Sharon and, or not Sharon, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I have part timers, so anyway, I gotta think. Sandra. <laughs> and and um, Hannah. <laughs> anyway, so they started talking and the other four here, and pretty soon after three or four years we got X number of believers. And you keep doing that. And I mean, you know, you think about winning the whole world to Jesus Christ and what a monumental task that would be. But you know, if you think of it in terms of if I win one this year and, and teach them to win one, that's one soul. That doesn't seem like too big a deal. Most of us could do that. I think of it as a sphere of influence, like your, your family, uh, your neighborhood, uh, your church family, your ministry, uh, the, you know, your local, you take all these and put them together, people that you know and you work with and all that, and you, those are people that you pray for and influence. And if you could just win one of those each year, and vice versa, and you think about it, and you carry that on out, how long do you think it would take to win the whole world to Jesus Christ? Some of you have probably done that, maybe not. Well, it's believed that Jesus Christ was on the earth 33 years and that he was crucified on the 33, 33rd year. And of course, we got Jeremiah 33.3 3 that we're talking about. And anyway, if you carry that out, and each year, each one of you continue to win and disciple one person, and, and that goes on through, in 33 years, 8 billion people would know Jesus Christ. Uh, if you think of it from that term, it doesn't seem like such a monumental task. Uh, and you pray for them, and you witness to them, and you share with them. It doesn't seem like a monumental task. It seems doable. But well, we know that there are people that win thousands, and some claim even win millions of people to the Lord, but thousands of people to the Lord, and then there's thousands that don't win anybody. So when you think about it, if you want to walk with the Lord, and you want to fellowship with Him, and want to do His will, and just you know, pass out tracts, talk to Him at work, whatever you can do to try to win people, then, then that's how long it would take to win the whole world, it would take 33 years. Now, I like to reverse that. And you think, okay, well, you know, Satan doesn't like you and I witnessing, so he'll uh, discourage you, get you down, say, why, you're wasting your time, it's vain to serve God. Don't, don't spend your time, don't worry about it, don't give out those tracts, don't talk to those people, they don't care anyway. And so he'll get you discouraged. Well, if you think about that, you say, well, what if we all got discouraged for one year? You probably think, no big deal. Well, let's think of it in reverse the way we're supposed to. If we go from the 32nd year, to the 33rd year, uh, you're talking 4 billion people that would not get saved because you took a year off. And you go the next year, it's another 2 billion people. So in three years, you lose 7 billion people all of a sudden that don't get saved because you took a year off or you got discouraged. Now, we, it's pretty easy for us to get discouraged. I get discouraged all the time. It's not hard to do. And the only way you're going to keep yourself in perfect peace is to keep your mind stayed upon him by reading and praying and, and following what he wants. So anyway, um, I was thinking today, you know, I was thinking about when I got saved. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. So we call on to him, and I called on the Lord, and I got saved, and asked him to come in my heart. It was actually a church basketball game that I was attending that a friend had asked me to come to. And I like to play basketball, but I never was all that good at it. But I went, and boy, I was shooting these baskets. I made one basket, and then my friend said afterwards, why don't you, uh, we all stick around, and five of us, we can play the whole game. Well, I said, that sounded good. And I don't know what it was, but I couldn't miss. This was before they had three-pointers. I could throw them from many places, swish, 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 swish. Somebody that played on a local team said to me, he says, uh, you sure you haven't played on a high school team? I said, no, absolutely not. But the Lord was working in my heart. He had invited me to the game, and I couldn't miss. You, you see him on TV, I mean, uh, uh, during the Final Four here and all this is going on right. Now, uh, there's a couple teams last night, but St. Bonaventure and that other team, they went to a period they couldn't make a shot for seven minutes. <laughs> and then the next time, <laughs> but whatever it was, but God was working in my heart. And as a result of that, they come up afterwards and asked me if I'd come to church the next day. And I did, and I went forward and got saved that Sunday night. And then I got a burden for the people in my family. I went to my mother, and I asked her with a burden. I said, you know, I, I told her my, that I'd been saved and asked her about this. And she says, I already did that. Well, I didn't know that. But she said there was a group that came out from the church, and uh, she had actually prayed with them one night. And then I got a burden from my grandparents. And uh, this is this fear of influence. You go around in your family, you start working with them. I got a burden for my grandparents. And, of course, it's hard to speak to family sometimes. I know they know you real well, and, you know, they know your faults and all that, and, 
uh, they can just start with you <laughs> and go on, and the, the devil will take and beat you up with it. <laughs> and so anyway, my, I went, I put, my grandparents were on my heart. So I was going to go to them, and I changed my mind back and forth two or three times, and, and finally I was getting ready to go off to Bible college, and, I, and finally I made peace with it. And uh, I was, it was evening, and Mom says, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to talk to Grandpa and Grandma. And so I went down there, and I knocked on the door, and went in, and they're watching Gunsmoke. Well, I like to watch Gunsmoke, so I thought, well, we'll watch Gunsmoke. <laughs> Grandpa said, what did you, you come down for? I said, I want to talk to you. I said, and, uh, so we went and watched Gunsmoke, and they're having a big shootout on there. And, and I'm listening to this, and one of them's Jacob, and one of them's Esau, and one of them's uh, Isaac. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, I said, I bet the old man's name's Abraham, isn't it? And it sure was. And, you know, God had gone before me. And, I, and, and that's the way the Lord is. Hitherto, if you ask nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive. You know, you ask God to go before you, make a way before you, and they were having the shootout. So afterwards, uh, I, I watched the show with them, and uh, I said, Grandpa, I didn't come down here to talk to you about uh, watch gun smoke. I come down here to talk to you about Jesus. So he respectfully got up and turned off the TV. And so I went through the plan of salvation with them that night, and uh, nobody, nobody got saved that night, but I, I started and uh, I sowed some seed and worked in, you know, and I was thankful, but I got that burden. Well, later, uh, some years later, uh, I was out in Kansas and for a week working, and uh, I had asked the Lord, I said, now give me another chance to talk to my grandparents. So I was out there, and while I was out there, she fell down the stairs. She had been kind of an invalid for quite a while in a wheelchair and various things, and she fell down the stairs. They didn't call me because they didn't want me to come rushing back. But when I came back from Kansas, uh, Grandpa said, Grandma fell, and she's up there in the hospital, and she didn't going to be around very long. So I, uh, I, God says, this is it. You asked for another chance to talk to her. Now this is your chance. So I went up, and, uh, and uh, as soon as I saw her, you could tell she wouldn't be here very long. It's just the way it was. And so I went up to Grandma, and I said, you remember when I come down and talk to you about Jesus? She said, she shook her head, yes. I said, have you asked Jesus to come into your heart, save you yet? She shook her head, no. And I said, would you like to do that? And she said, yes. And so we prayed that day, and a couple days later, she went to heaven. But, you know, we pray for our, our family and our friends and our coworkers and uh, whoever is in that sphere of influence in the whole world. We send missionaries out to, to talk to people we have not known and probably will never meet in most cases until we get on the other side. And so anyway, after that, I went to my grandfather a couple more times. One time after she passed, and granddad, uh, I asked him if he'd uh, accepted the Lord. He said he'd done something, but it wasn't very clear. And then <clears throat> when Peggy and I went another time, uh, I started talking to him. He said, Alfred, he said, uh, just leave me alone. He said, it's too late for me. He says, I, I, I don't even talk to me anymore about it. And uh, I carried this burden for like about 10 years. And uh, Peggy and I went out to the car. Peggy talked to him a little bit later during that evening. I went out to the car, and it's like this burden I had carried for 10 days. It just left. That was kind of scary. And I looked at Peggy, and I said, you know what? I love my granddad. I'd do anything for him, and I'd make that decision for him if I could, but I couldn't. I said, you know what? I'm going to start praying for granddad that he would take away his peace, that he would show him, show him what's coming ahead of time, that he could feel the heat, and the torment and all of that stuff. You know, that's, that might sound cruel. The Bible says it'd be better to have your arm lobbed off or your eye taken out and to go into heaven than to have all your faculties and go into hell. So I started praying that away. And me and Peggy both prayed that away. And um, I, I wasn't able to go to his funeral when he died. But my brother, I was back visiting them not long, well, some year or two after he passed away. And my brother says to me, he says, Al, he says, I don't know why I'm telling you this. And my brother made a profession with, with me when he was six. But he says, I don't know why I'm telling you this. But he said, Granddad told me a few days in advance when he was going to die. And he told me all he could do was feel the heat and the torment. And I said to my brother, I said, you know, that gives me hope. I don't know what his decision was, but I know God was answering my prayer. And saying, I don't know what his decision is. To this day, I don't have a lot of confidence that he's in heaven. But when we pray for people like that, or in, or in any other way, God promises to answer. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And so, anyway, that's, I, I, I talked to him. And then there was my aunt. And I would go to him one at a time, and I would talk to him. And my aunt was dying of cancer. She had lung cancer. And... Uh, I don't know, 
Some of you probably remember a guy named Tim Kaufman. Uh, he, he has a music ministry, and he was here back in the 80s in some of the churches, and he sang, and he had these little 60-minute uh, uh, tapes, cassette tapes. He had one called Hymns of Faith, People Need the Lord, Beautiful Land, and O Glorious Love. I think that was the four of them and for an offering. And they were just wonderful, and especially the People Need the Lord tape. It had a song, We Need to Love Them While We Can, and, and People Need the Lord. And I was out of my, I don't know how many of them I'd ordered, but I had one with me, and we're talking to my Aunt Wellman. The Lord says, uh, leave her that tape. I said, Lord, it's the last one I got. <laughs> I don't want to do that. But he said, leave her that tape. And so I did. And I thought, uh, uh, Lord, please use this in her life. And she died some time back, and I went to the funeral. And uh, it, her husband said she'd listen to that tape all the time. And I know she wouldn't have done that if she hadn't, the Lord hadn't worked in her heart. Because I had, when I was working, I, you know, we'd, people would ride with me sometimes someplace, and I'd ride with them, and then have their music on, and then I'd have mine. Well, I'd put that People Need the Lord tape in. They couldn't get out of the car fast enough. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. <laughs> so I know she wouldn't have been listening to that if she, if she didn't, something didn't change in her heart. So I, I know, and you know, the funny thing about that, I come back, we drove back from Missouri, that's where she was at, and I get over to First Baptist, and I pull up Sunday night at the curb, I think church service was over, and Pastor John comes out, and he hands me two brand new People Need the Lord tapes. I didn't know I ordered them, but they were there. I didn't know I did. I don't think I did order them. But that's how God works. When you put him first, and he makes up the difference in your life. And so, anyway, with your family, you reach out to them, and that's part of the sphere of influence. And then I uh, worked at Grandview Construction for like 25 years. Um, and, uh, you know, you start building a testimony there, like uh, Alan's talking about his co-workers and various ones, and we start praying for them and different things. And we were at this little church down um, at, uh, on the west side of, of Buffalo for about 15 years. We served there. And, I had an opportunity to speak and fill in at various times when the pastor was gone, and I would tape my messages and send them to the family and various things. Well, it came up that I had a, was going to have a chance, uh, well, the pastor, the first pastor was there was getting ready to leave, so he asked me to preach one Sunday, and I, I told uh, Peggy, I said, well, you know what, I'm going to invite one of my coworkers over to hear me speak, and then we'll have him over for dinner afterwards and, uh, and see how that goes. So I invited Paul and his uh, his girlfriend and, uh, and their daughter's over, and they come and heard me speak, and I preached a message on look and live about, uh, you know, look upon the pole, uh, let's put the serpent upon the pole. And anyway, they came over for dinner, and we had a good time, and uh, I was witnessing to him, and God was working in his life. And so a week or two later, I got another chance, and so I said, you know what, I'm going to invite another co-worker to come, and his family. And they came. And the same thing, I had them over for dinner and all that. So I told Peggy, I said, you know what? Uh, if we get another chance down the road, I'm going to invite the whole company. Now, we had three owners and their, and their mates, uh, two women and, and their mates, and a, a man and his, uh, his wife. Then we had a secretary and her husband and, uh, and superintendent and his uh, wife and two sons. And anyway, I invited the whole company. I got a chance. I said, if I get a few, uh, you know, a few t enough time to get it planned, put it that way, then I'm going to invite them. And so I had about two or three weeks or something like that, and so I invited all of them. And I was working up at Batavia, and the secretary calls, and she says, we're all coming. We're all coming. And you know what? I just started weeping like a baby because, you know, it's, it's summertime, and everybody's got something to do. And to think that they had enough respect to come out and take off on, a, on one of them weekends getting toward the end, it was August, in the, in the middle of August, I started crying like a baby. And the funny thing about it, when I mentioned this to my wife, she always got nervous. And, and, and she over. said she was about to say something, and God said, no, leave it alone. This is a me. Don't even talk about it. She needed some things done, and God provided the things uh, to make the house look good. But they come, and I spoke for an hour on, the Bible says, Jesus said, I have meat that you know not of. You know, we work, and we go out there, and we make this money, but what are we doing for eternity? What, what lasts? I mean, the meat that we eat, it perishes. The things that we do, is temporary. But I spoke for an hour on the eternal meat, and they all listened. And they all come over for dinner, and we had a wonderful time. And it was a special, just a very special time for God, because you want to reach out to your family. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the opportunity to do that. 
But God gave me that opportunity, and it was a, one, probably the highlight of my Christian life, to be honest with you. Probably about the other than get saved and my dad get saved. One of the highlights of my Christian life was that. And then later on, on Election Day 2004, uh, Paul's girlfriend called and said, Paul, let's talk to you. And he came over, and we got a, a table in front of our fireplace, and he, had, he got down on his knees and he asked Jesus into his heart there, right around the fireplace. And then there was another man that we worked for for years, his name was Daryl. He had cancer, three forms of cancer over a period of 10 years. And it's funny because God would not let me talk to him. He said, that sounds weird. I mean, God wouldn't let you talk. He wouldn't. He would let me talk to everybody else, but he wouldn't let me talk to Daryl. And uh, so anyway, it was weird really going on like this for several years this happened. And, and then um, we're um, down at Orchard Park working in the nursing home, and he's a supervisor on, well, we're construction. He's a supervisor on the job, and him and whoever was in charge of the, of the building was over here eating dinner, and me and Carl, we were over here eating dinner. And, um, they said, why don't you come over here and join us? The, his bo uh, or the guy at the, at the uh, nursing home said, why don't you come over and join us for dinner? I said, well, that's okay if you don't mind if I pray around you. He says, uh, uh, and he looked at Daryl and says, he, is he one of them people who preach and runs, things, run, runs all this stuff down your throat? <laughs> he said, no, no. He said, no. He said, come on over. And Carl says, let me talk to him because I would talk to him about Jesus all the time. <laughs> he gets tired of hearing it. <laughs> but anyway, it's funny because after those years, him and I were out on a job out in Amherst. It was an enclosed pool. And all of a sudden, the sky just opened up for six hours. I talked to him about Jesus. And one of the things I was talking to him about was the two on the road to Emmaus, and where it says, you know, I, you know, did not our hearts burn within us as he walked with us along the way and all that stuff. And Daryl says, I feel so lifted up. So anyway, that went on. And then he had three forms of cancer. And finally, they had a fundraiser for him because he was getting really bad and, uh, at the company. And me and Peggy went to it. There's, I think, about 400 people there. And, and uh, Daryl rolls over in his wheelchair and a big old smile on his face and looks at Peggy and says, I'm okay, you don't have to worry about me. He says, I've got Jesus right down here. And uh, he'd gotten saved October 19th. And so he had that big old smile on his face. You know, that's the thing, you know, ask and you shall receive. And I mean, it's not an easy job, but if you think about one a year and, and it just being faithful in that sense, I mean, between all the people you know and your ministry, you got all the kids downstairs, people working with, visitors, family, just sharing what you can. Somebody told me about putting tracks in, in your bills when you mail them out. Boy, that's a good idea. I started doing that, you know. You, can, you got about 10 or 15 of them every month you can mail out. You know, sometimes if you go up and give somebody a track, they feel a little embarrassed or something and they don't want to read it. But, you know, they're sitting there at their office opening up that bill nobody's looking at them. I suspect a lot of them get read. But anyway, we're sowing seed and we're doing the things like that and asking God to bless and work in our lives. And asking you shall receive that your joy may be full. And when you see those answered prayers, it, it, it makes a lot of difference in, 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 as you walk with him and it can encourage you. And um, anyway, I was thinking about a, I'm trying to think what I want to say next here. <laughs> uh, anyway, in regard to asking, Asking in regard to salvation for your family and various people. And then the second thought I was going to make is asking in regard to supply. But my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory Christ in Christ Jesus. Once I had three prayers answered in eight hours. That's once. That's the only time that ever happened. But once it did, I was, anyway, I was getting ready to go to Tennessee Temple University. And um, I went out to Kansas to see some family members. And I stopped and picked up a hitchhiker, which I don't recommend doing that, but at that time in the 70s, it didn't seem like a bad thing to do, so I stopped and picked up this hitchhiker. And anyway, I started talking to him about Jesus, and we talked for a while, and, and I took him to the motel that he had somewhere put aside, and, and I, I dropped him off there, and I prayed with him. Anyway, he asked the Lord to come into his heart after I talked to him. And so I, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, Sunday I'm gonna go down to this church that I used to attend when I lived out here, and why don't I pick you up? You go with me, and then you can go into the church. And uh, when they have an invitation, you can go down front and let people know you asked Jesus into your heart. And he said, well, that sounds all right. So anyway, I picked him up on Sunday, and we, he, he went forward and told the people he received Christ into his heart. And afterwards, I, um, I was getting ready to take him home, and he didn't have a Bible. And I had this New Testament in my pocket that I carried all the time, and it was really ragged. It wasn't really fit to 
use or give to anybody, but I pulled it out of my pocket and I gave it to him. I said, you know what? I said, here, I said, you take this. He said, I said, you need this more than I do. I said, what I really wanted was a brand new pocket Bible that I had to ask God for. It actually went in and tried to find one a time or two and just didn't find what I was looking for. And so I said, here, you take this. You need it worse than I do. I said, I've asked God for one and, uh, for, and he's going to give me one. And, you know, it, it talks about this as the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything in his name, he hears us. Uh, and so in John chapter 5. So anyway, I usually don't have that kind of confidence, but this particular time I did. And so I had to drive from Lawrence, Kansas back to uh, Illinois and uh, to my home church that night. It's about a six-hour drive, and, and I uh, had a job the next day doing a construction job that would give me enough money for because I was getting ready to go to Tennessee Temple. And anyway, but I didn't have any money, and I knew by the time I got from Kansas back to Illinois, I'd be out of gas. I had a 350 Chevy engine. It takes about 12 miles a gallon if you're lucky most of the time. And so, you know, after about 300 miles, you're going to be empty. So anyway, I give him that Bible, and I, I'm starting back across Missouri, and I said, Lord, you know, I'm going, to need, I'm going to need you either to keep this tank full as I'm driving across, or else uh, uh, give me a $20 bill tonight. Well, I should have been, had more faith than that. I should have been doing like the, the meal in the barrel, you know. You keep reaching in at the bottom and bringing some up every day instead of asking God for a full tank. It takes a lot more faith to just keep trusting. <laughs> driving on an empty tank, that, that's what I should have been saying, but I didn't. So anyway, I drive across the state of Missouri, and my tank starts going down. And then the third thing I said was, Lord, I said, uh, well, well, what I said is either keep it like that or give me a $20 bill tonight. And uh, I had to preach in the evening service in my home church, and then they have an early young people's meeting. So, and Brother Joe was the one that invited me to the Lord, or to the basketball game. He was my best man at my wedding and stuff and, and all of that. But anyway, he was the one that taught the young people. So I get back to Illinois about three or four minutes before the uh, early service starts. But I told the Lord, I said, here, I'd like to teach the young people tonight, as well as preach. So I said, if you want me to, give Joe a hard time, just bum fuzzle him, don't let him get anything together, and just confuse him. So anyway, I said, do that. Anyway, I get there about three, uh, three minutes before it starts, and he's at the top of the stairs, and he said, Brother Al, he says, I didn't know he was going to be here this soon. He said, would you like to teach the young people? I said, he said, I, I was just bum fuzzle, I couldn't get anything together. I was all confused. I said, no problem, Brother Joe. And then uh, I go in and I talk, teach the young people. And then uh, between the services, the pastor comes up to me and he says, Brother Al, said, well, you, you come down to my office. So I go down to his office and he reaches up on top of the shelf and pulls down a brand new pocket Bible and gives it to me. And then after I preach the evening service, I come out and a man shakes my hand with a $20 bill in it. So in eight hours, I got three definite answered prayers. Now, I've never had that happen again in my life like that. But, you know, God cares. He says... He'll meet your needs. He'll supply the things that you have need of. And, and in any way, he, he will do that for you. And when you do, when you see that kind of stuff, you get excited, you know. It's not some dead religion. Why are we going to church? Why are we wasting our time? Does God really love us? Does he care about the fact that my, my truck won't start today and my battery cable end? Does he care the fact that I don't have any vehicles to drive and he gives me two vehicles for two bucks in two weeks? Uh, and, and stuff like that. Or when I don't have any food and I throw $7 in the offering plate and I say, God, you take it, you ain't going to buy anything anyway, I don't have any food at home. I go home and somebody knocks on the front door and they got two bags of groceries and while I'm at the front door and taking the kitchen, I knock on the back door and somebody got a couple more groceries for seven dollars. I threw an offering plate because I was really a little ticked off at God because my refrigerator was empty. <laughs> so when God does things like that, you get excited about it. I had an IRS bill because when I went to I went to Chattanooga, I was self-employed, and so I was going to Bible college, and I thought it was more important for me to pay my bills than pay the IRS. Don't do that. Not, not smart. <laughs> but I did that. I did that. And anyway, I got this bill for two or three years of that, and, and you know, they put 20% uh, penalties on it and all that interest and stuff, and it got out of hand. I couldn't pay it. So anyway, after a while, they put a garnishment on my wages for about three years. And... Uh, uh, a guy at, at Grace that I knew worked for the IRS. And it's funny because people told me, you need to file bankruptcy, you need to do this, you need to do that. I said, that, that wasn't what God wanted. So anyway, I asked the Lord, uh, just kind of hung in there for three years with this garnish even on my wages. And anyway, there was a time when I was laid off work for a little while, and I didn't have a pair of work boots, so I went into Kmart, and I was going to buy a pair of work boots, but I wasn't working anyway, so I get up to the front front thing to check out and they're about 35 bucks and I said uh, 
you know what, Peggy? I said, I, I don't need work boots right now. I'm not working anyway. I just took them back. I said, we need this money more for something else. So I took them back. And two or three weeks later, I go uh, back to work. And there's a, at First Presbyterian Church, they have like a, a clothing thing there. So I went in, I found a pair of shoes for a dollar. And a couple of weeks after that, Peggy, she loved the yard sale and the garage sale and this, and she found this place. And she had me come down there to this place she found, and they had a, a pair of work boots, just like I was gonna buy for 35 bucks, for five bucks, brand new. They had a pair of steel toe work boots for $5 that, that fit perfectly. And they had a pair of steel toed fireman's regular boots uh, for five bucks. Uh, just what I needed for pouring concrete. So instead of uh, spending 35 bucks for a pair of shoes that I didn't need at the time, I spent half that much and I got three pairs of work boots and a pair of fireman's shoes uh, for, for, for $16. And that's how God provided for me. And then some time passed and those wore out. And I, I, I said, Lord, I need some boots again. And so we're over to Carousel and they put a bunch of stuff out because Peggy liked the garbage pick and she's out there looking through stuff and she said she found a work boot. I said, well, you know what, there's probably another one around. Uh, so I, I got out and went and looked for it. I figured it, and somebody left them in their locker and they threw it out. Sure enough, I found the other boot. And we're, uh, so I got this pair of boots and on Wednesday night at Grace Baptist Church, I'm giving this testimony. But I got this huge IRS debt that I'm talking about. And I'd talked to this guy that was in the IRS before, and he, he didn't seem too favorable to my situation. So, but time passed, and he had some friends that the IRS took to the cleaner, so he had a different attitude. Well, he hears me give this testimony, and he says, uh, uh, on Wednesday night, and, and that week, it comes up in the office where he works. Somebody says, yeah, we got this Garner Seidman on this Alfred McElroy guy. He says, we're getting 10 bucks a week. And he looks at him, and he says, well, you ought not be getting that. He said, I heard him give a testimony on Wednesday night about a garbage pick pair of shoes. He said, that's the best testimony I heard in years. And so he comes to me after I get back uh, the next weekend and he t tells me about this situation. He helped me with this IRS debt. We get through it for uh, what was called an offer and compromise for a few dollars. He's the one that gave me that van for a buck and took me on a fishing trip. So instead of bankruptcy or some other kind of deal, God used the garbage pick pair of shoes to get rid of probably over $20,000 worth of debt. So that's how God works. And when he does that, you can get excited. Ask and you shall receive. Uh, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So anyway, when we pray and we have that relationship with God, that will help you and encourage you and keep you going. And when you keep witnessing to people and thinking, you may not see anybody safe for a while, but you know, just think about one a year. Anyway, let's pray. Time's over. So. Father, we thank you for your love and for your goodness and for your grace and mercy to us tonight, Lord. Thank you for loving us, providing our needs, taking care of us. Be with our pastors. He comes back tomorrow. Give him safety and continue to be with the Berge family. We just pray you'd raise Nathaniel up and meet their needs and work in our lives. We just thank you for the many testimonies we have here for our church, for our pastor, for Lady Faith and, and her mother. And just take care of this whole situation and work our lives. We pray for the meetings coming up that you just revive us. Get us into your word and keep us in prayer and keep us meditating on your word and fellowshipping with you. And thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.